Good morning, uh, everybody, and welcome uh, at this presentation about the uh, <coughs> Tundra station at uh, Chokwardag in uh, Russia. So my name is uh, Monique Heijmans. I'm an uh, ecosystem ecologist, and together with uh, Jules Limpens and Ruina Magnusson, we are doing some research at this uh, beautiful site. We would like to acknowledge Interact support. So the names here with an asterisk received Interact support and they could assist uh, with our research. So the Chokwardag Tundra site, where is it? You can see the asterisk uh, here. So it's in uh, Northeastern Siberia. It's the region named uh, Yakutia or Saha Republic. And it's quite north, it's almost uh, 71 degrees north. And the climate there is extremely continental. So that means that there is a mean January temperature of minus 34 degrees, while July can be quite warm. So that mean July temperature is even above 10 degrees Celsius. You can see uh, the site is located on uh, continuous uh, permafrost, so there's really thick ice-rich uh, permafrost in this region, and it's overlain by a relatively shallow active layer of 20 to 50 centimeter, and it's not that far from the tree line. So how to get to this uh, field uh, station? Well, first we have to travel to Yakutsk, we, then there is a flight from Yakutsk to the town of uh, Chokwardag. You may see that this uh, place is on, on an outcropping of this Yedoma plateau. And from uh, Chokwardag, we travel by boat on this meandering river <laughs> to get to the field station. So you can see there's lots of uh, thaw lakes and drained thaw lake uh, basins. And indeed also our field station, well, our the Russian field station is, is located in an old drained thaw lake basin. So what, what kind of landforms are there? What does the tundra look like here? I have a very high resolution uh, satellite uh, image. So you see here the, the river. I don't know if you can see that, but you can even see. So here are the huts and maybe you see the white lines, the boardwalks. So this is really very high resolution uh, picture. Uh, this is of course the, 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 the drained uh, Fall Lake uh, basin surrounded by some Yedoma remnants. And uh, there's also some uh, degrading polygonal tundra here. So on this picture, the gray color is mostly uh, dwarf shrub uh, vegetation with betula nana as the dominant plant species. The whitish is mostly uh, sphagnum uh, moss, while the more bright green is uh, graminoid vegetation, uh, sedges and uh, also like uh, Irio from Angustifolium. Um, yeah, the tundra, you can see a picture here, looks uh, really green. So when I show, for example, this picture to students, they are always surprised that the Arctic can be so, so green. But um, is the area changing? Yes. <laughs> You may say here, you see this circumarctic view with trends in maximum NDVI over the years 2000, 2021. And you see that our tundra site, the, well, our, the, sorry, the Chokodach tundra site is, is in a browning region. And potential explanations for this browning are ecological disturbances such as fire and permafrost thaw, which trigger additional complexity in Arctic uh, greening trends. So how come 
the tundra is browning and that's most likely related to the fact that the permafrost here is quite ice rich and you can see here exposed uh, ice near a lake and you see here also the brown color of soil organic material which will be decomposed into the greenhouse gases uh, CO2 and methane. Just another picture of the excess uh, ice in the permafrost. And you can see here that, that there's these blocks of soil with, with grass. So th this has just fallen down. So this is like watching live uh, the falling of permafrost. Um, there's lots of uh, small scale permafrost uh, to see in this uh, drained uh, Fall Lake uh, basin. So we see, for example, the shrubs drowning, but at the same time, we already see often the, this graminoid vegetation invading the, the open uh, water. So this, uh, it seems we see this at quite many uh, places. So there's quite ice rich uh, permafrost at shallow uh, depth. So any disturbance uh, could result in, in soil subsidence because of flowing of ice uh, lenses or ice wedges. Um, these are snapshots of the very high resolution satellite uh, images in which I can show an example of uh, changes. Um, for example, here pond six, so the black is uh, open water. Uh, the pond six, that the, the open water wasn't there in 2010. So this is a relatively young far pond. And there's also, for example, pond seven has grown larger. But there are also, yeah, so a four pond uh, looks like uh, this. So the pond six was a young four pond. So we see the dead shrubs here, but there's not yet establishment of new vegetation. While in this four pond, uh, the Eriochrom argostifolium, the graminoid vegetation has already established and which might be followed by uh, invasion of uh, sphagnum moss. But there's uh, yeah, multiple locations. You see that the, yeah, I should explain this. So the, actually the gray color is mostly, is, is dwarf shrub uh, vegetation. Black is open uh, water. And the light color is, is moss uh, vegetation. So, particularly along the margins of this, this, this shrub vegetation, there's quite some of this small scale permafrost degradation taking place. So, I think it's clear to see that there is more black, more open water on the 2015 picture than on the 2010 picture. But uh, of course, this is uh, just some snapshots. Um, so, my colleague uh, Runa Magnussen analyzed the very high resolution satellite images. So, we have satellite images for 2010, 2015 and 2019 and when analyzing the aerial surface area changes, it's clear that the, the area is, is changing quite uh, rapidly, which is summarized in this figure. For example, uh, it's clear that the shrub vegetation has uh, declined in area, uh, the same applies to the tussock vegetation, which is a fine scaled mixture of, of dwarf shrubs, graminoids, often uh, lichen vegetation is relatively stable, 
but particularly the open water surface has increased by 50% over a nine year time period. So that's, yeah, of course the area itself is still low, but it's rapidly increasing. And in this open water, usually uh, sedges uh, invade, uh, followed by uh, sphagnum moss uh, establishment and expansion. So these are all percentage uh, changes. So you can see in this nine year time period that the landscape is, or is changing quite rapidly. And at the same time, when new open water is formed, some other open water might be uh, colonized by sphagnum and disappear. So it all overall, it uh, results in a picture of a rapidly changing tundra landscape with overall increase in wetness. So the tundra landscape is, is clearly uh, changing. And well, this is a picture of 2017 when there was large scale flooding of the tundra. So I would like to acknowledge particularly our Russian uh, friends who enable doing research at this uh, field station, but also financial support by the Netherlands Polar Program and EU Interact. And I have a few recent papers listed here, which I think uh, might be very interesting. And uh, yeah, in the left uh, top corner, you see the Siberian uh, cranes, iconic uh, bird species, which uh, have their breeding grounds in the region of the Tundra site. I probably have forgotten to mention several things, but there's uh, now room uh, for questions. Very much, Rick. We have time for just a few very brief questions. Yeah, it's Kath. Um, sorry, I don't know why I'm looking to address the question. Um, so it's really interesting that um, we're seeing changes in the sort of vegetation. Is that going to have some sort of consequences for the, the animals that live there? Is, is that going to, you know, put them under pressure? Um, oh, that's... <laughs> yeah, actually there are some uh, new animals uh, at the side moving as, yeah animals are moving uh, northward. <laughs> Actually, uh, there are not that many animals, or there used to be not that many animals, except for mosquitoes, which are very, very, very numerous there. Uh, but now there is uh, the musk ox uh, are increasing in abundance. So we've seen musk ox. There are also, two years ago, it was the first time we saw a brown bear footprint. Also, Martyr has, uh, is moving northward, so there's definitely uh, new animals arriving, perhaps also new plant species arriving. The area is not only changing in terms of wetness, <laughs> but indeed also in terms of, of animals. Thank you. Sorry, I ha we have time for one more question. Nicholas, yes. please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Niklas Lava. I've been uh, involved in the Interact project for the last four or five years. So I'm looking more at you, local and indigenous peoples. So mm -hmm. uh, that is happening. Growing up in rain urban, now doing different kinds of work in helping researchers like Terry and Margarita and Amanda. But my question is that uh, how are local and indigenous people? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how, how are local and indigenous people affected? Well, the, the landscape is, is, is changing rapidly, and particularly because of this permafrost degradation, the degradation of ice rich permafrost. 
So through our contact persons at uh, in Yakutsk, at the Institute of uh, Biological Problems of the Cryolithosphere, we hear stories that, for example, whole towns have to be moved because the ground is not yeah, is subsiding and is becoming uh, <laughs> wetland. Uh, also, traditionally, there has been some agriculture in, in drained fall lake uh, basins in Alaska is the local uh, name. But also those grounds are not often become too, too wet. So because the, there's a large extent of ice rich uh, permafrost, the, the surface is really very unstable, <laughs> so to say. And this limits, of course, uh, options of yeah some small scale agriculture or whatever and uh, yeah so there are stories of whole towns being relocated to other locations